Last July, my family and I were involved in an accident. We were travelling along a road in Scotland and the back end of the car spun out. We were heading straight first into a lock. It was touch and go for a moment, but fortunately we hit some trees instead of going into the lock and we think that saved our life. The whole thing sparked a big debate amongst my friends. The kind of guys saying, actually, isn't it incredible that God saved your life? And then other friends saying, what are you talking about? If God really cared for you, then you wouldn't have had the accident in the first place. So who was right? Those who say God was looking after me, or those who say God just doesn't care. The accident happened because a wagon had spilled diesel all over the road. The guy had just driven away and left somebody else to clean up his mess. I guess he'd have no idea the consequences that just a couple of hours later, a family would be travelling along on their holiday, minding their own business, and end up having a terrible crash. It's a moral evil, I suppose. Suffering caused to somebody by somebody else's bad choices. Can you blame that sort of thing on God? A couple of years ago, there was an earthquake in Italy. A primary school collapsed and killed some kids. Absolutely devastating. People started to ask questions at the time of God. Where was God? Why would God allow this suffering to happen? Some even said it was God's fault. God, why have you done this? Engineers turned up on the scene and started to work out why it was that only the primary school collapsed. As their investigations began, it became clear that actually the builder had taken off a load of the money, put it into his own bank account, and it ultimately it meant the building was unsafe. It wasn't God's fault that the building collapsed. It wasn't a natural disaster, although an earthquake did happen. It was that man's choice that made that happen. The Bible uses the story of Adam and Eve to highlight truth about the world. In the story we read that God created a perfect paradise for Adam and Eve to live in and be loved in. He could have created Adam and Eve to be like robots, programmed to love him and do what he asks. But would that be real love? Of course it wouldn't. Forced love isn't love at all. It's slavery. And so Adam and Eve are given a choice and freedom. It's what philosophers call free will. It's as if God, the author of life, writes the first word. Creation. And then Adam. And then he hands the pen over to Adam for Adam to write his own story. At any point Adam can hand the pen back and let God write a love story. But Adam keeps tight hold and even though he tries his best, he begins to write an absolute horror story. In Adam's story it's all about Adam. He ignores God's warning and eats from the tree. The consequences of his actions are quick to follow. And just as one bad apple spoils the barrel, so one bad Adam spoils the whole of creation. Throughout history we see the same story repeated. People writing their own selfish story over God's, with disastrous consequences for the people all around them. God's intention was no pain, no suffering, no tears. These just weren't in the design. But there was love and so there had to be choice. And where there's choice, there's selfishness. And where there's selfishness, you will always find suffering. But what about the stuff where nobody's to blame? The stuff that happens because of natural causes, where you can't actually blame anybody? Cancer maybe, or children dying? What happens in those situations? Where's God then? In March last year, we had one of those phone calls that everybody dreads. It was early in the morning, the phone went, and we kind of just knew what it was. My little niece Hannah had been struggling with various different medical conditions, and earlier on we'd found out that she had a brain tumour. The phone call went and we kind of knew that was it. We went up to the hospital, but it was too late. Hannah was gone, and all that was left was a little shell. You know, where was God then? Where was God in that situation? He had the power to sort all that out. I'm a Christian and I passionately believe in a God who loves. But where was God's love then? God had all the power to take away Hannah's suffering. God could have made it better. And yet he didn't. Why does God allow suffering like that? Those questions are difficult and hard to answer, but I don't believe God causes suffering. And I don't believe he just stands there and watches it happen either. When I was a lad, my mum brought home some soap 
that smelt and looked like apples. I was desperate to try a little bit, and so I did. I'd taken one out of the box and shown it to my dad. Dad, look at that, doesn't it look amazing? Can I have a bite of it, Dad? Dad said, no. Please, Dad, just a little tiny bit, it looks great. Dad said, no, it's poisonous and it'll make you feel sick. I turned round and I had a little bite and it was disgusting. It tasted bitter, it burned my throat and actually it made me sick. Dad was right. I turned back round to apologise to him and explain that I thought I was feeling really bad and it turned out Dad had been watching me all along. I couldn't believe it. Dad, why on earth didn't you stop me having a bite of the apple? Dad just looked me in the face said, son, one day you'll understand. He didn't say I told you so, and he didn't really shout. He just kind of picked up the apple, had a little bite himself, and that night we felt sick together. That night he became my hero. I don't think God causes suffering, and I don't think he just sits there watching it happen without caring. He doesn't say I told you so, and he doesn't just leave us alone to deal with the mess. The father says don't eat the apple. I know it smells good and looks good enough to eat, but it's poisonous. It tastes bitter and it'll make you sick. The child ignores the father, takes a bite, and just as the father predicted, the taste is bitter and it hurts. And so what does the father do? Wash his hands and walk away? No chance. The father becomes like a son. He puts himself in our position. God became man. Emmanuel, God with us. His name's Jesus, which means he will set his people free. He's born into squalor and suffering. He feels pain. He feels frustration. His friends get sick, his family die. God's been there. He knows what suffering feels like. But the story doesn't end there. The Bible teaches that in the ultimate act of love and sacrifice, God himself lays down his life for the sake of the world. The curse of Adam's selfishness is broken and just as death and pain and suffering entered creation through one man, so love and hope and freedom re-enters through another. The hope that Christians have in Jesus is that their cursed and broken body is as good as dead, but their soul, the bit that makes them really them, has been freed from a curse and that one day it will live in a world restored to perfection. It's not all fixed yet, but one day I believe it will be. So, God and suffering, who's right? Those who say God loves and protects, those who say God doesn't care, or even those who say, well, God does it on purpose. I'd like to suggest that God whispers, I love you amongst our suffering, and that God will overcome evil in the end. The journey's hard and it's tough, but the view will be worth it in the end.